Hello, everyone. I'd like to go ahead and get started with today's Citrus Research Exchange. I'm Brandi Nonicki. I am the founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab. Over the past 10 years, we have hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovators on this stage and are glad to see all of you here today. Today's talk is co-presented with the Citrus Policy Lab, which supports interdisciplinary tech policy research and engagement in the interest of society. We ask that you please do not interrupt the speakers, but wait until the end of when we will do the Q&A session. There will be individuals with microphones walking around. Please wait to ask your question until you receive a microphone. But before I introduce today's panel session and speakers, a few additional announcements. On October 8th, our Citrus People and Robots in Women and Technology Initiative will co-present a celebration of women in robotics in honor of Ada Lovelace Day and be held October 8th in this auditorium from 1 to 4 p.m. On October 9th, which will be the next Citrus Research Exchange next Wednesday, um, the presentation will be Race Your Facts, Making AI Work for Enterprises. And that will be again from 12 to 1 p.m. here in Bonato Auditorium. Today's panel on the future of 5G for California, ensuring equitable access will explore emerging trends in 5G and provide recommended strategies to better ensure equitable deployments. 5G wireless networks hold great potential, enabling unprecedented advancements in linking robots, cars, and other sensor-enabled technologies and infrastructure to revolutionize our cities. While the future of smart cities may bring gains in sustainability, mobility, and economic opportunity, Ensuring these benefits are felt by all community members remains a significant challenge. Today's panel will explore emerging trends in 5G and provide recommended strategies to better ensure equitable deployments. I'm honored to introduce today's esteemed speakers. We'll hear from each of them first. They'll give a five minute, just quick presentation of the main points that they wanna make today. After each present, we'll all come onto the stage and have a panel discussion. The first presentation will be from Ernesto Falcone. He is Senior Legislative Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, focusing on intellectual property and open internet issues. Then we'll hear from Heba Gamal. She is the Senior Director of Market Expansion and Growth at Common Networks, a technology startup bringing high-speed internet to suburban neighborhoods. And then last, we'll hear from Shireen Santosham, and she is the Chief Innovation Officer working with San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo and leading efforts to build San Jose's smart city vision and strategy. So with that, I'd like to bring up Ernesto to give the first five minute lightning presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Ernesto Falco and I'm the Senior Legislative Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I, uh, I'm, I lead a lot of our research work on the future of high-speed competition and the issues of uh, ensuring that every American gets access to the next generation internet. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk a bit about the challenges because uh, that the United States, as well as California, which is not too different uh, than where the rest of the nation is, on achieving that goal, the goal of every single person gets access uh, to what should be you know, affordable, competitive, universally available access to next generation internet. So these different kind of pictures here tell the, the story of, of where, how far behind we are and how far ahead everyone else is uh, in the world to kind of give you a little bit of a framing. Uh, industry has done a pretty phenomenal job of really hyping 5G without simultaneously engaging local government, state government, federal government uh, on, on the necessary infrastructure policies to, to achieve this goal. I mean, there's this dynamic of marketing, but then not really synergizing that with, with the amount of actual work necessary. The slide on the bottom left talks about uh, it's a study from uh, the Deloitte uh, firm that you know, estimates we're talking about a $150 billion investment in infrastructure. You know, something that, is, that dwarfs most traditional transitions of, of wireless technology, which have normally been about licenses and spectrum. This is purely about infrastructure. When I say infrastructure, to be more concrete, I'm talking about fiber, uh, dense fiber networks in every, in every uh, market that's going to deploy these systems. So in the fact that most of the United States does not have a lot of what we'd say gigabit broadband connections, and, and for the foreseeable short-term future, we will not. Uh, absent a change in policies, you know, you have Verizon struggling just to cover one, one football stadium, right? 
The, whereas South Korea, which has already done, done year, years ago in, ter in terms of deploying universal dense fiber networks, they already hit a million users. And they did that in a very short period of time. So here's federal data about where the nation is in terms of access to uh, high speed internet connections. The bar on the right is every connection over 100 megabits is when you start talking about these high capacity networks. Uh, the very thin top line is where you have two or more providers, uh, which means you know, robust competition. The, the line at the 21% margin is every American who has two choices, right? The rest of that, monopoly, right in the middle, no, cho no choices at all. And that has real implications about the potential for ubiquitous deployment for 5G because it's dependent on what the wires on the ground are able to deliver. Uh, and it's, and you know, this forum is, is really important because the distribution is really divided by income uh, and or uh, where you live, whether it's urban or versus rural. Uh, if you're on the upper half of the uh, median income scale, you're likely to have two or more choices. You're more likely to have, and these are choices at, at 250 megabits and 25 meg uh, downloads, 25 megabits uploads, it's getting closer to closer what fiber looks like, what is necessary to deploy 5G. And, and at the end of this, I'll show you why I stress the wireline infrastructure so much in terms of the wireless, wireless future. Um, but you know, it is, it is a situation where our policies for the last, I would say, decade plus have allowed the companies to kind of choose where they serve. And what has happened is they kind of choose the most lucrative, low-hanging fruit markets, deploy aggressively there, and then the further away from kind of the easy markets to deploy, they, they tend to neglect or, or ignore outright. Uh, overwhelmingly, that being, if you're on the bottom half of the income scale, the, the bottom half, right, that's not, that's a huge part of, the, part of this country, uh, you're likely to face no choice or monopoly, or if you're in a rural market, same dynamic. So to, to wrap up just on the, the why the wireline infrastructure is so important and what the capacity of the wires are able to deliver and how it synergizes with, with 5G, this is a, a mapping study by an association called the Fiber Broadband Association, which uh, is, a, is a collection of a handful of fiber companies, really explaining that the slide on the right is effectively what the neighborhoods would look like if you're talking about having hot, you know, ultra high speed wireless 5G connections you kind of spread throughout the streets as you're walking and spread throughout the neighborhood. Um, the blue lines are your fiber lines. That's how much fiber we're talking about, which is not too different uh, than what it looks like if you had fiber to home in more markets. Uh, the, the triangles are essentially the, the placement of those small, what they're what are called small cell towers. Uh, and you know, I look forward to kind of just to talking with the, our fellow panelists and, and others, but ultimately what this means is the future is really going to be dependent on whether your local government, your state governments, your fe and the federal government really adopt fiber policies, policies that are focused on universal deployment uh, with an aggressive timetable with the requisite investments necessary uh, to fill in the, the void and the gaps that, that currently exist under current policies. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Heba Gamal, as uh, Brandy mentioned, and I lead our new market expansion and growth at Common Networks. Uh, I think very similar to some of Ernesto's comments, uh, I think we can all agree that internet access is no longer a luxury or an, am or an amenity. Uh, internet is now an essential human right where uh, by accessing the internet, you're able to access healthcare, education, economic opportunities. And cities that invest in uh, this type of infrastructure uh, are going to see more uh, economically advanced and prosperous uh, residents in their cities. Uh, but with all of that said, again, to Ernesto's point, um, not very many people have, actu have actual choice when it comes to home internet providers in their, um, in their cities and uh, neighborhoods. And that's exactly where Common Networks comes in we have uh, pioneered a uh, graph-based network that relies on rooftop hardware to bring high-speed internet to people's homes. What you see right here is our typical installation at a customer home. And we've been growing. We are currently in five markets. We're in Alameda, San Jose, uh, Alameda Oakland, San Jose, San Leandro, Santa Clara, and Sunnyvale, and we're expanding quickly. Um, we're doing so by building next generation hardware. Uh, this right here, what you're looking at is hardware that our team has built. Uh, 
uh, we've already deployed this hardware out into the real world and we're building the next generation hardware which is poised to bring up to one gigabit speeds uh, to, people's, to people's homes. Um, but I want to take a moment and tell you a little bit about kind of how we work, uh, how, how our network works and how we've been able to, to build it out. Um, in a traditional wireless internet service provider model um, where you go, for example, to a, um, to a rural area, uh, the wireless internet service provider will find a fiber source uh, and will find a, a potentially very high point in, in that neighborhood, maybe a water tower. Um, they, will connect, uh, they will connect to fiber at that location and then will install you know, radio antennas so that they can start serving the first set of people. And that's exactly what would happen. Um, but take that model and then um, you know, apply a multi-hop, multi-radio, uh, graph-based network that we've built. Now we're able to take those first, uh, let's say, 100 homes that we're able to see and distribute that capacity to and multiply that. And that just continues to grow. Every single node, quote unquote, customer that we add to our network essentially is able to um, redistribute that capacity over and relay that signal to their neighbors. Um, so truly creating a, a community-based um, uh, connection in, in neighborhoods. And this is, this is actually one of my favorite slides because I feel like it, um, it explains exactly how we've been able to do this. This is a, an actual picture of our deployment in Alameda, which was our very first city. Um, all of these green dots are connected homes. And as you can see, the lines that you see might, might look unexpected uh, or not necessarily super uh, organized. And that's exactly the innovation in this. Our network allows us to be a true alternative to fiber to the home and allows us to build that technology in an organic way. Um, there's one concept when uh, big providers start thinking about bringing fiber to the home, uh, which is the cost of homes past. In order for them to deploy these large uh, construction crews and trench the roads, go through the permitting process with cities, um, they actually have to do their modeling and their fin financial modeling based on how many homes they're going to pass and make that, um, make, make that return on, on investment really, really positive for them. Uh, that's why you see a lot of the fiber to the home deployments kind of gerrymandering their way to wealthier neighborhoods and more affluent neighborhoods because that's where they believe they're going to make the highest ROI. That's not the case with our model. Um, in the time that it would take a fiber provider to even just think about going to a neighborhood, we can actually deploy. We just did that in San Leandro in less than six months. That's it. Great, thank you. Okay, and thank you. Thank you. So um, just to give some context to this conversation, I think it's very relevant to what uh, Ernesto had talked about earlier. Um, you know, when, when I joined the city, uh, the mayor's office about four years ago in San Jose, um, I had come from a background uh, in the telecom space and looking at digital equity. And, you know, looking around San Jose, which is the largest city in Silicon Valley, I realized actually we didn't have great broadband infrastructure and I suspected we had a pretty um, large digital divide. So. As we started to look into this, so we got a, a, some money and some resources, um, we discovered that we had only 3% high quality fiber in the ground. We really had a duopoly and we did some crowdsourced speed tests in our community and realized like the advertising speeds were not actually, the advertised speeds were actually not what our residents were getting. Um, we found digital deserts, so whole neighborhoods that didn't have um, connectivity, uh, in, typically in lower income uh, areas of the city. And we have about 95,000 residents without internet access. And we did a study looking at low-income families um, with children and, and found that over half our low-income population is not connected. This disproportionately <coughs> affects uh, Latino and African-American households. And you know, we had to do this ourselves because the FCC data is actually not even very accurate because it relies on um, census blocks. And so. Uh, we started to paint this picture of like, hey, we really have to do something about this. <coughs> and, um, we explored uh, everything from just being kind of laissez-faire, which is what, it, what had resulted in this, to municipal fiber. It didn't make sense for us to do municipal fiber um, 
San Jose is 180 square miles. It's just too expensive um, in our area. So what we decided is that we really needed to incentivize private investment. And so we started with, you know, analyzing the market, the broadband market, digital divide. We wanted to invest, in, incentivize private in, investment. And then we started to negotiate with multiple telecom carriers at the same time. Um, and so, you know, what we decided to do was to, you know, get these contracts for 5G small cell deployments um, and then use the dollars to uh, close the digital divide for our low income areas of our city. And, uh, you know, we'll get into this later, but all of this is a great strategy, but then there's a whole legislative fight on top of this um, around FCC rules um, and state level rules that we had to navigate. And, and luckily we navigated it quite well. Um, so in the end, it, you know, this, the past couple of years, um, San Jose is actually gonna be what we believe to be the largest uh, 5G deployment in the country. We'll have over 4,000 small cells. It's actually 4,200. We have agreements with AT&T, Verizon, uh, Mobility on behalf of Sprint, and T-Mobile. Um, it is a, a total of over $500 million in investment to San Jose. It is a massive construction project, so we have to install 800 miles of fiber. And so this is, um, to Ernesto's point, people don't realize this about 5G. Is like It is a huge amount of fiber that needs to go into the ground, um, and it is a huge coordination challenge uh, overall for a city. Um, and, you know, but one of the things we did on these agreements that helped us is that we really thought about what the carriers and businesses wanted, which are basically two things. One is speed of deployment, and two is um, testing new technology. So we did work with them um, to deploy about $4 million worth of uh, IoT technology in our city. So we've started with um, 12 parks where we have Wi-Fi, earthquake sensors, um, and dynamic lighting, and you know this is really important because, for example, one of those parks is a safe parking location. So for people who are living out of their cars, they've lost their home. You know, it's a place they can go and take showers. They get Wi-Fi, um, and, they, and it's a safe, you know, secure place to to temporarily stay uh, until they get back on their feet. And then, um, you know, the most most innovative thing I think that we did was um, we did go back to our city council and we got unanimous approval to earmark. Uh, the funds for this digital inclusion fund. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, the, the second point I want to make before I go there on um, working with the companies is that we are deploying these, ver these things very fast. So we're now at about 30 days uh, to permit, which is twice as fast as what the FCC rules are. And we did that by using some of this money to like retool uh, how we operate and permit. And so um, we did that, and then the remaining funds um, go into this uh, digital digital inclusion fund, $24 million. Um, we're gonna be giving out uh, one to two um, million dollars worth of community grants uh, every year for 10 years, and we're the first city in the country to pledge to close the digital divide. The applications for this actually went live yesterday, so we're very excited. Um, and you know, the digital divide in cities is really uh, a complex issue that is as much coordination as it is sort of a funding and willingness uh, issue, and so it's really gonna be a centralized way for an entire community um, to address this problem. And so happy to talk more about any of this uh, or sort of the policy issues around it. Um, the high level outcomes that we're hoping to achieve is connecting 50,000 households uh, to, the, to broadband as well as uh, digital skills. So it's both skills-based and connectivity-based. Um, and we have really like clear indicators uh, and outcomes that we'll be working on. And I think that's it. Great, thank you. I invite everyone to come up on the stage. Great, well thank you for those um, remarks that you've each given. Um, I think we often think of the digital divide as an urban rural divide. And for good reason, there's 24 million Americans in rural areas who don't have access to broadband internet. But there's also a divide in the urban um, context. And there's a lot of hype around 5G as being a technology that's going to really enable greater inclusion in urban areas. Um, so first I'd like to kick us off with, well, what is 5G even, right? We keep talking about it, but what is it? Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> I think, I think there's a lot of hype around what 5G is. I think demystifying what that truly is, is is a good place to start. So 
um, 5G is really a, uh, a guidance on where the next level of uh, technology for communications needs to be. It needs to meet a certain criteria. There are a lot of different ways we can think about 5G. Um, I'm obviously biased because I do think that fixed wireless is a fixed wireless access is really really important part of uh, 5G uh, when when we're talking about it specifically because um, 5G technology uh, relies heavily on like high bandwidth millimeter wave technology relies heavily on line of sight so that means you really ha need to have high density of it um, but also uh, have it outdoors. Uh, this is also really interesting to think about as we start thinking about the consumption of data. Is it happening indoors versus outdoors? Uh, we all have our smartphones and we are all walking around, but uh, actually all of the indications are saying that you know, data consumption indoors is going to increase over time. Mm -hmm. um, with you know, video streaming, tech, uh, education, um, healthcare, all of these things. Uh, but I think that's kind of like at a high level um, where we're at today with 5G is, is these uh, guidelines that need to be met um, from, a, from a speed perspective. And then there are multiple kind of ways we can tackle 5G and fixed wireless is one of them. Um, sub uh, 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 six gigahertz is one way and then 24 gigahertz and, and over is another way. Uh, yeah, and I think the, the, the big innovation that, that gets less spoken to because a lot of people look at the speed side of this equation um, is fifth generation wireless is a way to more efficiently manage networks uh, for different sets of uses. It, the, the technical term is called network slicing, which is why the, a lot of the discussion talks about like automated vehicles and Internet of Things and broadband access because you, now you're gonna be able to tailor a network in a way that achieves different needs and different uh, responsiveness uh, in a way that no longer kind of cannibalizes from each other, where, where, it, where 4G and previous networks kind of had to share the resource all at one time. Um, there's just a real big advancement of the division of labor w with these towers, uh, which is why it has a, a tremendous potential if it, if it could be uh, deployed nationwide. So one thing that I keep hearing is small cells. And I had a, a meeting with somebody from Verizon and I asked them about small cell deployment. Why are they called small cells? Um, and it's my understanding that because they don't reach that far, mm -hmm. they have a small radius. And it was also quite surprising that each small cell, as I understand it, has to be connected to fiber. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so could we talk a little bit about what does that mean for an urban setting to have these small cells that each need to be connected to mm -hmm. fiber and you need many of them densely yep. populated? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start real quick. Um, the reason why they they're, they can only reach short ranges is, is, is physics. Um, in the wireless space, if you're trying to move a lot of information, you need really high frequencies of, of what's called spectrum, the airwaves, because, the, you, the, because you need kind of the space, if you will, to, to put in the information and the signal to deliver those high speeds. Um, on the f and, and the higher you go, the more it starts operating like visible light where obstructions, weather, uh, all sorts of things can obstruct. On the flip side of the equation, just to kind of give you the full physics side of that, um, sonar and like under you know radio towers and, and things that go uh, that have minimal amounts of information that have to deliver over huge distances, uh, very low spectrum, right? So these are kind of the two sides of the physics realities. Um, and so if you're talking about gigabit wireless or 10 gigabit wireless and, and beyond, you have to keep going further up, which means your range starts shrinking uh, more and more. At the same time, those towers have to have the capacity to be able to deliver that service to multiple users, uh, which is where the fiber equation comes in. Fi fiber is the only transmission medium uh, that can deliver a, a, an extraordinary amount of information. Um, the world's internet travels across the ocean through a handful of fiber lines to, to give you a context of how much can you pull out of fiber uh, in terms of the amount of information you do, um, which is why there's, there's this deep connection between high-speed 5G uh, and fiber wireline networks. So I can speak to sort of what that means for you know anyone living <laughs> in an area is you know it means like pretty much these these pieces of equipment have to be put every 800 to 1,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty it's pretty dense, right? So um, in San Jose, that's 4,200. Typically, they're going to go up on street light poles um, because they're at the right height and they have electrical in them. 
Um, but unfortunately, you oftentimes need to reinforce those poles because maybe a street light was designed to just hang a banner, but like a heavy piece of uh, electrical equipment means that structurally you need to reinforce that or rebuild it, and then you need to rewire as well to make sure that the electrical load is safe. And so um, that's a very costly prospect for, uh, for, for companies, which is why this is you know, an expensive thing. And for a city, I mean, we, our responsibility is to make sure that that's safe. So we have inspectors, you know, we have to permit it, we have to make sure that thing's not gonna fall over in the middle of the street, which, which certainly happens with poles. Um, and then beyond that, you know, residents typically don't, you know, they may not like the aesthetics of it. And so um, we have in San Jose design guidelines that we've worked out with the carrier. So these things kind of look like cylinders on top of a light pole. They're not that obtrusive. But much of the legislation that's gone on in uh, many states across the country and the federal legislation actually allows for equipment that's the size of a, a refrigerator. And so um, it's much more permissive than you know, what we would like to see in our community, and we've, we've managed to get around that, but it is an issue in places where, you know, they haven't had that discussion. So one thing I want to talk about is the, the need for the fiber access, and Heba, you alluded to this in your presentation, that fiber tends to be deployed in more lucrative or wealthier neighborhoods. Um, so then what role will 5G deployments actually play in widening or closing the digital divide? Yeah, I mean, I think for... For us, and um, I don't know if you all recall the, the image I put in there, um, so the, our deployment works very different from small cell. Um, not, every, uh, not every single hub or relay in our network needs to be fiber connected. We actually use uh, high bandwidth millimeter wave radios that can actually distribute that capacity wirelessly. So that means um, we may have one, just to give you some numbers, um, in Alameda, uh, which is uh, 32, about 32,000 um, uh, housing units, we've deployed 20 uh, relay hubs, uh, if you will. So those are, um, and those are all wirelessly connected. And we support the entire island with only three <coughs> fiber sources. Um, in when Verizon did their um, their initial. Um, test in, uh, in 5G deployment in uh, Sacramento, it took them 700 of these small cell deployments in order to reach 5% of the population. Wow. We, we reach 80% of the island. So there is, there is difference in, uh, and all of this falls kind of under 5G, right? I think that's what's really confusing mm. and, and is important to demystify is that um, we, we believe that you know, technology has come a long way, especially wireless radio technology, that can allow us to redistribute that uh, that fiber. And if we continue to see the trends that we've already been seeing, which is fiber tends to go to kind of you know the main street and the downtown areas, you can then redistribute that fiber and then start getting it into the neighborhoods where mm -hmm. fiber or fiber to the home uh, builds are not necessarily going to happen. Right. And Ernesto, in your presentation, you talked a little bit about the need for more fiber investments. How can we actually incentivize that with companies? Should there be legislation proposed at the federal level or state level? So um, I, I think it's worthwhile to think about the difference between a large kind of lumbering, debt-laden, vertically integrated uh, national ISP versus uh, companies like Common Networks. Mm -hmm. AT&T and Comcast, for example, they have about $150 billion in debt from merging with, you know, satellite television company to HBO Go and all sorts of things. And so they have to repay that debt. So for them to contemplate major investments, uh, it's not in the equation. This is why AT&T has basically discontinued their fiber deployments, uh, which up to this point was mandated by the government as a result of their DirecTV merger. However, there's lots of other small players who are eager to deploy. Common Networks is one. There's a, there's a handful in, in San Francisco. And, and I think policy has to start shifting away from deference and following the lead of the, the large telecos and large cable companies and start asking these small companies like, well, what, what can we do to make it easier? Um, because I think they're eager. I think they're, they, they're not uh, kind of trapped by the short-term investment window that stockholders expect because they're not large publicly traded companies um, with all this debt. And, and the realities are every other country has been able to figure out how to get to universal deployment or has a track record on the way there. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's a matter of just policy has to kind of reorient, reorient around who, who's gonna be delivering it to us if not the large players. I have a really quick follow-up question. Do you think that the current Federal Communications Commission would be supportive of uh, supporting smaller providers instead of the large incumbents? I think then, no. I think the <laughs> I think the lar the FCC is really they're a great great example of deference to um, the largest players dictating policy. So just yesterday, there's this big court decision from the DC Circuit on the issue of net neutrality. Mm -hmm. Every small ISP I have ever talked to, dozens across the country, all were fully supportive of the 2015 open internet rules that, that require net neutrality in their networks. Because none of them are interested in, in reshaping the internet and figuring out how to squeeze the extra penny out of your usage of, of broadband. They're just interested in delivering broadband. Um, and one of the most interesting things that came out of the court decision yesterday was this issue of what's called poll attachment rights. Um, basically, under federal law, there, there is this special right to getting access to the polls and the infrastructure and as a means of overriding inco private incumbent interests who own those polls who don't have an interest in allowing competition in. Uh, it was granted to cable TV companies historically because of the, their challenges of getting into markets. Prior to them was the telephone companies because the energy, com energy companies kept them out. And because of the FCC's approach to telecom to be fully deregulated, let's just take our hands off broadband altogether, the only companies that have legacy special rights to that infrastructure are telephone companies and TV and cable TV companies. So new companies who are deploying next generation stuff uh, are not even on the same playing field in terms of the legal rights. And, and they have to depend, you know, local governments are really essential to try and offset that. California had exerted its own authority to fill this gap. But this was, a, this was an obvious problem that would have been created by the decision from the FCC that was ignored. Uh, and so, yeah, that's why I pretty much stand firmly that they, they listen to the big players on policy and without realizing dozens and dozens and dozens of other players who are doing better, faster, cheaper, and, and future-proofing technology are, are kind of sidelined because they just don't have the access to the political process uh, in the same way. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point about the increasing role that local governments are playing. So like in San Jose, um, Shereen, could you talk a little bit more about the Digital Inclusion Fund and some of the strategies that you guys are um, starting to explore? Sure. Um, so, I mean, this fund is really like the large, it's the first of its kind in the country, and it's the, it's, it's a grand experiment. It's, um, it's fully funded essentially privately by the money we're getting from telecoms, and we'll, we'll do some philanthropic uh, fundraising on top of that. But it's really meant to get back out into the community. You know, we know the community knows where, um, where they're lacking. I mean, there's there's a, a huge number of issues that are happening uh, across the country, but you know, San Jose is a little bit of a microcosm of it. Where you know, for example, you know, this the public schools have all these goals around digital learning, yet not all the schools have actually one-to-one -one laptops in the school. So how is that actually going to happen, right? So we're we're bringing people around the table there. Um, we had launched in our public libraries a coding camp for, for children um, with the goal of getting to 5,000 kids. It's called Coding 5K. Uh, we thought we'd get maybe 1,000 kids the first year, and we, we hit our 5,000 mark in the first year. So there's a huge pent-up demand um, you know, in the community for this kind of work. Uh, and so this first round of grants, um, we're really letting them be open. They'll, they can ask for connectivity devices, digital skills, education programs for um, the community around uh, helping people understand why children or older folks might need access to the internet, and then um, sort of innovative programs. So we're just casting a wide net and seeing what comes back, because there's really interesting things happening. Like, for example, there was a teacher I met um, who decided to, to do uh, repair program so it was one of the schools that did have Chromebooks and what she did is um, teach these little you know sixth and seventh graders how to repair the Chromebooks and so they became essentially the help desk for the school because the IT team Amazing. was overloaded and couldn't take um, all of these requests and then the kids also like needed 24-7 IT help and like the school IT closed at like three right yeah. and so um, these kinds of things we're hoping will bubble up um, and we can sort of scale. Great. Yeah, and um, I just want to add, I think, I think, like Ernesto and Shireen both said, local government can be huge. Um, we've recently uh, decided to partner with the city of San Leandro. Um, for those of you who don't know, the city of San Leandro 
about 15 years ago, decided to do a major investment in their own fiber optics plan. And they came up with this master plan, uh, put fiber all throughout the city, and then did a public-private partnership where they uh, gave some of their strands over to, a, to this organization, Lit San Leandro, which then started offering uh, enterprise access, enterprise connectivity access uh, to businesses in, in San Leandro. And then from there, the city also, about three years ago or so, uh, built a public Wi-Fi uh, network. Uh, but the interesting thing that happened over the past you know, three to five years as they were doing all of these <coughs> developments is that the residents still felt left out, right? Mm -hmm. they, um, people could have amazing internet when they, when they go to their work in a, in a nice office. Uh, they could actually you know, access the internet while they're walking the street or while they're hanging out at a park. Uh, but then they couldn't get the same sort of connectivity at home. Uh, and we felt like that was just a perfect uh, partnership for us. So we actually partnered with the city where we are leasing some of their dark fiber uh, that they haven't been able to redistribute or, um, or, or basically extend to these neighborhoods and um, lease also some of, license some of their uh, rooftop of the on their city facilities so that we can build out some of these dark coverage hubs. Mm -hmm. And um, we just launched, we actually just had our launch event on in a couple week, uh, last week and in our kind of early access period, we had over 3,000 residents pre-register for our service. And that's how much demand there is. People are just really, really interested, interested in having access. And I think that model is a really, really great model, you know, where you are able to provide really, um, you know, world-class um, uh, fiber connectivity to your businesses have public Wi-Fi so that you can really give access to people in gathering areas and public areas where people come together and then have an affordable choice or at least an alternative choice to your residents. Um, and we're hoping that we can kind of replicate these models across uh, with, with as many cities as possible. And even if they don't have fiber, or even if they don't have <coughs> the facilities, just the ability to be able to build that triangle, I think can be, can be huge. Mm -hmm. I like that you point out this more holistic approach of engaging people at all their different engagement points, home, work, um, public institutions. Um, so one thing that was brought up in the presentation, Shereen, that you said the FCC data is woefully inaccurate. So what strategies can we employ to gather better data? And what roles should the public and private sector play in that? Yeah, and I'm sure Ernesto has, <laughs> has a lot of thoughts on that too. Um, I mean, one is, uh, you know, the data is by census track and it's self-reported <laughs> mm -hmm. by the companies. So an entire, one census track could be miles and miles in rural areas and multiple neighborhoods. So that means you have one, connect, one house connected and you count the whole area as connected. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's just wildly uh, inaccurate. Um, and so you do see, I think it was like, from, places like Vermont where like, you know, the state government had like teams going out and actually testing speeds across the whole state just to look at the accuracy um, relative to the FCC data. You and Microsoft come out and say it's not 24 million Americans, it's actually 160 million Americans that don't have access. So like the numbers are just all over the place. And that's why we did our own study. I mean, we, we worked with Stanford um, and with a nonprofit to do, you know, street surveys, but then we also did uh, some work with PwC um, to analyze all the data that was like publicly available. And so we ha we got a pretty good like neighborhood picture, but most, you know, local governments aren't going to have folks who are like interested or able to do what we did. Do you have any ideas on what they could do? Um, I mean, I think like we did. There there are low cost ways to do it. Like we certainly. Um, the crowdsource speeds test is really easy to do, <laughs> just to figure out you know what's going on in your community. So we we threw one out, and within two or three weeks, we had like close to four thousand folks participate. I mean, we have a tech savvy community also. Um, you can uh, the street surveys are not super expensive. I think we did the whole thing for a hundred thousand um, dollars, and we we privately raised that money. So um, you know you can do that. I think, uh, and then. Um, I think academic institutions are always useful yeah. in helping with it. Well, we love to hear that. <laughs> we are very useful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, we also have our California Public Utility Commission, which does its own mapping and its own data uh, assessments. And I think there's probably room for, for updates and, and, and improvements there, particularly kind of thinking about what the future should look like. Um, so not everything has to depend on the FCC, right? Like we could take matters more into our own hands. Our state's very powerful in many ways. 
uh, and, and we have a state regulator. Uh, and you know, what's interesting too, some of the stories of kind of the most, you know, most rural and small communities out there, um, sometimes they don't really need a survey, right? Like they kind of just, as a community, they all know each other, right? They all kind of know exactly what their neighborhoods look like and, and local leadership tends to be very close and, and, and very knowledgeable about what their, what their local community looks like. Uh, which then opens the door to a lot of these these community projects, bu uh, building their own uh, infrastructure, building their own ISP, uh, which you're seeing more and more often in, in many of these parts of the country. So I have one last really quick, I'll call it a lightning question. So respond with just what comes to you as fast as possible. What do you think will be the greatest positive impact and the greatest negative impact of 5G deployment? Uh, I think the greatest positive impact is, is definitely more um, prosperity across. Uh, I think the the most negative impact can uh, can potentially be the, the lack of awareness of what it is and how people can access it. Uh, most positive impact I think is the the potential for all sorts of different kinds of networks to exist and what that means. Uh, if you build the resource the innovators come and, and I have no clue what the future looks like I just know someone's gonna have some neat ideas. Uh, the most negative, I would say, is it, it, it may, similar to what I was emphasizing, it may take our eye off the, the fundamentals of, of what is missing in the U.S. telecom market um, in terms of, of just the, the hardened capacity and the infrastructure that is necessary. Um, for me, I think, you know, the, the innovation, the potential innovations, which aren't there yet, are, are really um, mind-blowing. So, you know, if it can be utilized for autonomous vehicles at some point, it can't today. Um, you know, that's going to unlock like a whole next generation of types of innovations for us, um, which is going to be exciting. On the negative side, I think it will deepen digital divides because we don't have these fundamentals down. And so the folks who are behind now are going to get left further behind and get really locked out in a way that um, is going to have massive negative impacts. And then the other is, you know, the enabling of more like surveillance without privacy protections. And we really, you know, need to, to figure that piece out. And that's something we didn't touch on at all today, <laughs> surveillance through these technologies. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for audience questions. There are individuals in the back of the room with microphones, so just raise your hand so that they can come to you. Thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question about the relay one. So uh, I have a question, do I have like fairness a problem if I was a uh, uh, user and more close to the fi fibers, will I more conf often be the relay? Will it mean that electric bill will be higher or my speed will be slowed down? Will be how do you, how this like be fairness? Also, how to make sure the data is secure if it's like the user have the hardware and you use unlicensed bit? Is I have make sure that how you make sure the data is secure? Thank you so much. I think this is for me. Um, great question. So uh, just to make sure I'm clear, one is. Um, if you're close to the fiber, how uh, how much degradation do you see in speeds if you're farther away? Was one right? No, it's like uh, fairness because I'm more often be relay, so it's like my electro bill will be higher, or because I'm transmitting other people's data, so I'll be slow down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so no, the short answer is no. So you don't actually see any uh, slowing in your in your speeds or your in your connectivity as you relay the the. Um, the connection to other people. Uh, we use multi-hop, multi-radio uh, technology to ensure that that doesn't happen. So there's one thing that we do is we ensure that there's redundant, redundant paths back to the internet for each customer that we connect. And then we ensure that because of the multi-hop, multi-radios uh, uh, multi that we use, the, the users are also getting the same amount of speeds. We see higher speeds, of course, across the board, uh, but it doesn't actually take away from you if you are relaying the, the, the signals, if that makes sense. And then your second question was about um, speed data and privacy. Yeah. So we actually, this is something that is fundamental to, to, to the way that we built our network. So we've actually built the network uh, inherently with all of the firewalls the, uh, and, uh, and the security is built in, so it's automatically there, and it's built not only in the software, but also in the hardware. Hi, 
Um, so I'm curious, if you were advising a large um, multi-location system like, say, the University of California, mm -hmm. um, what kind of recommendations would you have uh, if, say, the CIO were considering 5G deployment on the campuses? I'm thinking from your presentations, you know, could the UC system be a force for good in helping to distribute, uh, you know, community-wide at the locations where they are, you know, sort of this next generation, or are there other... Um, things that you would caution against uh, an organization like that? I think, you know, like from a, a system-wide um, perspective or a, a nonprofit um, public public sector perspective, what would you recommend or caution? Oh, oh sorry. Um, I think, especially like a public institution, a very large public institution, so whether it's a university or a state government or local governments, um, there is enormous potential of open access fiber being the, if, you're, if you are going to build the infrastructure to service your need, the, the reality is there's so much capacity in those lines that there's no way you as an individual institute, an enterprise user will use up the entire capacity. So there's just so much available to be able to share and, and you can have, you, 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 you may unlock the opportunity for like your, you know, your local uh, business person to decide, you know, I'll just resell that capacity and start being my own ISP locally. Um, so I think if, if local governments put a, and this is really kind of the infrastructure policy question, um, really building out and expanding on open access fiber and allowing uh, multiple users to make use of that, all that excess capacity uh, can go a long way. Yeah, and I, I would build on Ernesto's comments to, just to say that um, what we've seen really work is institutions like that can be extremely powerful. Um, as Ernesto mentioned earlier, um, there's just a lot of legacy laws that companies like us get caught in. So uh, I spend a lot of my time talking to local um, city governments about how we are not a telecom provider, how, we, how these, um, these laws really shouldn't be applying to, uh, applied to us uh, based on the equipment that we use, the technology that we use, and the service that we provide to the community. Uh, we recently actually partnered with Mesa Public Schools, for example, where uh, it's a market that we're looking at, and we're going to be utilizing their infrastructure to build out the basically the skeleton of our network in West Mesa when we launch there uh, early next year. Um, so I think institutions like that can be extremely powerful in helping um, smaller companies and um, not the big providers basically provide something unique to the community. And uh, yeah, I'd say. Um I gave this example earlier, which is the school district that we're working with, which I think is like the third largest school district in the state of California. It's like 23,000 students. Um, you know, we, through funded through their bond, we help them put up a free Wi-Fi network for the entire community. And so we had you know 6,000 families start using it immediately um, in a low-income area. So the more that you can provide those kinds of services to the community, the better. My word of caution would be um, to be really thoughtful about the security of your system. So two thirds of cyber attacks this last year were on municipal governments because they're more out of date with their security protocols. And so, um, you know, be, be sort of thoughtful about security uh, in that process. It's Shireen Ernesto Hubba, thank you so much for joining us today and talking about the future of 5G. I think it, we're in a good place. There's some work to be done, but I think <laughs> we're, we're going to get there. So please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>